Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on AQA acids and bases. Now this video is dedicated to AQA so it's not like one of them generic resources or generic videos where it can cover topics which may not be applicable to you. This video is actually dedicated towards AQA and is, um, is produced in line with the specification. So if you're studying AQA A-level chemistry then this is perfect for you. Um, there is actually a full range of revision videos like this for AQA. I also produce some uh, whiteboard tutorials on specific topics in in, um, in chemistry as well uh, and also I've done some exam paper um, past paper walkthroughs um, just to improve your exam technique there's loads of information on there as well very comprehensive so um, it's all for free there's no charge at all so all I ask is that you hit the subscribe button and that'll be perfect that'll be brilliant and the more people who subscribe and keep watching I will keep on making the videos um, you can, these videos actually are, th this style of video is actually made from um, just PowerPoint slides. So um, you can actually purchase the slides um, in the link below in the description box. If you just click on that link and you'll be able to get a hold of them there. They're great for vision, great value for money. Um, and you can use them on your smartphone, your tablet, and I know people who print them out as well and use them as revision notes and write all of them. So, so they are perfect for that. So just go and have a look, click on the link below and you'll be able to get a hold of them there. Okay, so like I say, um, these videos are dedicated to um, o uh, OCR. <laughs> They're dedicated. I do have OCR ones as well, um, but these ones are for AQA and they match the specification. So the type of things that you'll see in this video are going to be things like Bronsted Lowry acid base equilibria. So we're going to look at that first about what they are. Then we're going to look at the definition and determination of pH. Then we're going to look at ionic product of water, which is KW. And then we're going to look at the Ka for weak acids and weak uh, weak acids and bases. So we're going to look at that. Um, and then we're going to look at pH curves, titrations and indicators. And then finally, we're going to look at buffers. So there's a lot of information in this video, but it is in, it is in that order. And we're going to look at um, all of these different aspects. It's quite a tough one, this, especially the buffer solution. It can be a bit complicated, but... You know, my job is to try and make this as simple as I possibly can. So at least if you understand it, you can then apply it and use it as you wish. Okay, so let's start with Bronsted Lowry acids and bases. So um, Bronsted Lowry, um, Bronsted and Lowry, should I say, they were Danish and British chemists respectively, and they collaborated to come up with a theory to explain how acids and bases work. So you can see the fine chap on the left there is Thomas Lowry. And the other chap there on the right is Johannes Bronsted. So these two both came up with this theory. And it's the theory that we use, to be honest, um, you know, most of the time, um, you know, when we're describing acids and bases, a very, very popular common theory. Oops, um, gone the wrong way. Okay, so, so there they are there, right. So Bronsted Lowry acids are proton donors. That's what they said. So they said um, acids donate protons. Um, and they said that actually when we mix these acids with water, hydrogen ions are released. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. So these hydrogen ions, they don't exist on their own. Um, so they've actually, um, they actually form hyd hydroxonium ions, also known as hydronium ions, which are H3O+, as you can see there, there's your the H3O+. Um, and it's these that actually makes um, the solution acidic. Um, however, normally for simplicity, we don't write H3O+, plus, we write H+. Plus. But what you've got to be aware of is the acid is actually the H3O+. Plus. Um, it's not the... Um it's not H plus in in reality, but you're gonna be um, you're gonna be seeing me use H plus quite a lot. It's just you just need to be aware of what actually makes it acidic as H three O plus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so here's an example equation. So we can normally, and you'll see me use this. HA is used to represent an acid. I wrap that with water, and that forms your hydroxonium ion or hydronium ion, as you can see there, uh, and our A minus. So this is typical um, of an uh, of an acid uh, of an acid reaction of how we actually produce these hydronium ions or hydroxonium ions. They've got two names. That's why I keep flipping between the two. Uh, Bronsted Lowry bases are proton acceptors. Um, so acids are proton donors bases are proton acceptors and so when we mix um, the bases with water they react with the H plus ions um, and they form hydroxide ions so it's the hydroxide ion OH minus that makes something basic okay and H pluses or H3O plus should I say in, 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 the, in the proper term um, is um, what makes something acidic 
So here's an example. So normally we use the letter B to represent a base. Um, that reacts with water and it forms BH plus and OH minus. So um, that's just showing how OH minus ions are produced and what makes something basic. Okay. So let's have a look at some examples because we're talking about acids and bases. So we're going to look at um, some examples of weak and strong uh, acids and bases. Now you need to be able, you need to be able to identify what is classed as a strong acid and a strong base, and what's classed as a weak acid and a weak base. And we're going to go through each one of them um, and look at some examples and their respective um, equilibria equation as well, reversible reactions. So remember, um, when acids and bases react, they form. Uh, when they react with water, they form a reversible reaction. So your acids produce your H3O+, plus, as you can see there. There it is, H3O+, plus, and your bases form OH-. minus. So this is what they this is what they actually form. Okay, so strong bases dissociate or ionize almost completely, and weak bases dissociate poorly. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, and then your strong acids, they dissociate or ionize almost completely, but your weak acids dissociate poorly. So they don't they don't dissociate very well at all. So you can see there's a link between um, bases and acids in terms of their strength. So let's have a look at the first one. So let's have a look at a weak acid. So weak acids are generally your carboxylic acids. So things like ethanoic acid, as you can see on there. Um, normally the, um, well, for information, not normally, the backwards reaction is favoured with weak acids. Um, so you don't get many H plus ions produced. And this is going to be quite important when we look at uh, buffers, for example, later on, because weak acids play a very pivotal role in the formation of buffers. So knowing where equilibrium lies in these in these reactions is quite important. So equilibrium is lying well over to this hand, this left hand side here. Um, you're not going to get many H plus ions or um, or many of your um, ethanoate ion, which is here. Okay, so strong acids are things like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, um, all of these different types of um, acids here. These are normally, normally called mineral acids, so they're not um, organic acids. So the forwards reaction is favoured strongly in these types of reactions. So remember, we, as we assume that with strong bases, they dissociate almost completely. So we get loads of H plus ions, and to an extent, we can make assumptions with some of these that actually 100% all of these dissociate so, um, to form your H plus ions. And we'll see that when we're calculating pH of strong acids, we make an assumption that they actually do fully dissociate. Okay, so let's look at strong bases. So strong bases are um, chemicals such as sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide. Um, so for information, with strong bases, the forward reaction is favoured strongly, just like with strong acids. Loads of OH- ions are produced, so we get lots of these. It's heavily weighted towards that side. There isn't many of these, if any, um, sodium hydroxide molecules. Um, and then the final one are weak bases. So weak bases are, um, example is ammonia, NH3. Um, in these types of reactions, it's it's a bit unusual, but we'll look at it a little bit later on. But ammonia actually reacts with water, it needs water to produce the OH- ions. If you notice here, your strong bases have um, hydroxide groups already attached to them. Your ammonia doesn't have any hydroxide groups. So it's a weak base and it needs water, heavily relies on water to produce the OH- minus ions, as you can see there. Equilibrium is live well over to the left. We've got loads of this. We haven't got many of these OH- minus ions at all, which makes it obviously a weak, uh, a weak base. So you can see here, there's your strong bases and there are your strong acids at the top there. Okay, so make sure you familiarize yourself with these and crucially the position of equilibrium with each of them because this is going to be pivotal all the way through this video okay so we're going to look at some acid base reactions um so um looking at how these actually react and what we actually produce so remember when acids and bases react with each other the protons are exchanged so this is according to the bronsted lowry theory so you can see um in this generic example here we've got an acid reacting with the base um so you can see h a plus B will form BH plus and A minus. So you can see here that the positive and negative ions are produced um, and we've formed effectively what is a, a salt um, and and um, and the A minus bit here will then react with um, whatever's around here depending on what, it's, um, you know, what, other, what other ions are, are present there. 
So we always form two ions, basically, a positive and a negative. So remember from um, year one chemistry, um, this reaction is in equilibrium. And so if we add more acid, which is HA, or base, then equilibrium will shift to the right to use it up. So if we increase the amount here, then it's going to shift to this side and produce more of these products here. And likewise, if we do the opposite, if we add more BH plus and A minus, this will shift to the left hand side. Uh, equilibrium we use that up. So that's Le Chatelier's principle. So you, you'll probably be familiar with that from year one. Okay, so water behaves as a base when an acid is added to it. Um, so you can see here in this equation that the uh, water has actually accepted a proton. So um, water is acting as a base, not a neutral in this in this circumstance here. So because it's accepting a proton, it's a base, and obviously acid is donating the proton to form the A minus. So that is definitely acid because acids are proton donors. Okay, um, so remember with strong acids, um, equilibrium lies well over to the right, and weak acids, equilibrium lies well over to the left. Um, that's very, very important. Have I said that already? <laughs> it is definitely really important. You, you're gonna, you're, you're thank for me. You're, well, you'll thank me for it later. Okay, so let's look at another um, uh, another aspect of acid base, and this is the ionic product of water. Okay, now water is really really special in this in this area of chemistry because water um, has a, an ability to um, well, it has its own um, constant, and we call this the ionic product of water, which is Kw, and actually water. If you look at a glass of water, water doesn't just contain H2O. Even if it's purified water and it doesn't have any of the, um, you know, the the fluoride that you'd normally get in tap water, but um, water actually exists in equilibrium with its ions. In other words, a glass of water doesn't just contain H2O molecules. It actually contains. Um, it's actually in equilibrium with H3O. This is your hydroxonium or hydronium ion, um, and it contains the OH minus ion. So. The water is actually in equilibrium with these ions. So in that glass of water, you're going to have um, these in existence, all three of them. But we can simplify that, of course, um, to just show H+. Plus. Um, you know, this is the reaction we're really going to use uh, more often, um, is the simplified version. But again, you just need to be aware that in reality, it is the H3O plus that exists, the hydroxonium ion, or also known as the hydronium ion. So... What we can do, um, we can actually um, write this as a, a an equilibrium constant. You would have seen this in equilibrium, uh, in equilibria um, equations such as Kc, for example. So what we're going to do is create our um, Kc expression for this reaction. So this is going to be H plus OH minus. Remember, it's products over reactants. So H plus OH minus over H2O. Um, and so this can be applied because we've got an equilibrium reaction. Okay. However water has a bit of a um a unique well not unique property but it has a, a, a pretty specific property should i say where actually um water dissociates incredibly weakly okay it doesn't dissociate very well at all so in fact there's very little oh minus and h plus ions compared to h2o and so what we can assume is that the concentration of water actually has a constant value now this seems a bit weird so let me just explain this in a bit more of a, a tangible way. So imagine if you've got a millionaire, okay, and you were to give a uh, hundred pounds to that millionaire. It's almost like a drop in an ocean for somebody with that amount of money, okay. Uh, but let's say if you give it to somebody who hasn't got any money and you give a hundred pounds to them, that's going to have a much greater impact on, on that person, so increasing their wealth by a hundred pounds from zero. Um, you know, they're significantly you know, their percentage increase is, is significantly higher than compared to somebody who's already a millionaire. So this is a bit like water. There's so much water around that any changes to, um, you know, any changes to the ions that make up that water is really going to be insignificant. So what we can do is we can effectively ignore the effects of water because we assume it has a constant value relative to the amount of H plus and OH minus. So um, with that in mind, we need to come up with another expression, okay, to to kind of tackle this property of water. And so, if we multiply the two constants, um, Kc and the concentration of H2O, then we get a new constant called Kw, which is the ionic product of water. And so, the units of Kw are moles squared dm to the minus six. And so, here is our Kw expression, which is here. Okay, so Kw equals the concentration of H plus and OH minus. And you're going to use this um, particularly in calculating the pH of um, bases. So this is going to have a, a 
pretty significant impact. So make sure you're aware of that KW expression. Okay, so we're going to continue on with the ionic product of water, so KW, and there's some important points related to the value of that that um, we really need to go through. So um, the value of KW is the same in a solution at a given temperature. Okay, so whatever its value is, it's exactly the same. This is similar to um, Kc as well, that it is the same at a specific temperature. Um, so Kw at a given temperature um, has a value of 1 times by 10 to the minus 14 moles squared dm to the minus 6. You've got to remember that number. That's very important, as you'll see later on. So um, the value changes if the temperature changes. Okay, so this is at a given temperature, remember. And so the pure water has an equal concentration of H plus and OH minus ions. In other words, the concentration of H plus ions equals the concentration of OH minus ions. Now, this is because um, these are derived from the same product, which is water. Okay, so they're, designed, they're derived from them. So you have to have for every H plus ion, you must have an OH minus ion because they've, been, they've actually come from H2O. So when referring to pure water, what we can then do is simplify it. Oh, I love, love simplifying equations. Why make it more complicated than it needs to be? Yeah? Chemistry is already tough enough as it is. So thankfully, we could simplify it. So Kw equals H plus squared. Okay, so we assume that the concentration of H plus equals the concentration of OH minus. Right, okay, so we're moving on. We're going to move on to pH because um, you wouldn't be able to talk about acids or bases without talking about pH. So there's going to be a little bit more maths here um, with relation to the pH equation. So pH is a logarithmic scale that measures the concentration of H plus ions in solution. Now, if you do maths, um, then yeah, A-level maths, you may be um, aware of logarithmic scales as well. Obviously, we use the log scale within um, pH to effectively... Um, convert what are very um, small numbers into um, you know more reasonable numbers and we come up with something called the pH scale which is effectively a logarithmic scale of acidity so we know that um, if something has a pH of zero it is classed as very acidic um, if it is a pH of seven it is neutral and if it's a pH of 14 it is a very basic um, substance that we have so the equation to calculate pH is this so it's pH equals minus log, uh, minus log to the base 10, concentration of H plus, okay? So um, pH can be calculated when we know the concentration of H plus ions. So this is H plus ions in solution. So let's look at an example where we're going to uh, calculate the pH of hydrochloric acid. So um, we're going to calculate the pH of 0 0.03 moles per dm cubed of hydrochloric acid. Very straightforward because you make an assumption here. Um, but um, hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, so we assume that it dissociates fully. In other words, whatever the concentration is of hydrochloric acid, it will produce the same concentration of H plus ions because we assume it fully dissociates. So what that means is that um, we can assume um, that it fully dissociates, and so therefore whatever the concentration of this is will be the concentration of that. And so if we use the pH equation, we can simply just put in the figure that we've got for hydrochloric acid and put it into our um, our pH uh, equation here. So you can see we've got pH is minus log base 10 not, times by 0 0.03, and that gives us a pH of 1.52. Check to make sure that is correct, because uh, that figure there is 1.52. That suggests a strong acid, which is fine because um, the question has used hydrochloric acid, so that's what we, we would expect. If you're getting a figure of somewhere like 13 or 14, clearly something has gone wrong, because um, obviously hydrochloric acid is definitely not a base. Not the last time that I checked, anyway, of that strength. So, um, the concentration of hydrogen ions can also be calculated when we know the pH, so we can do the opposite, okay? So, here's the example we're going to use. So, we're going to calculate, whoops, Okay, I've gone too far. So calculate the concentration of hydrogen. I'm too keen. Calculate the two. Uh, yeah, calculate the concentration of hydrogen ions of nitric acid with a pH of 1.7. Okay, so we need to work out how many hydrogen ions are in the solution with a um, with um, nitric acid of that pH. So very simple. Here we are. We just inverse the uh, pH equation and we get H plus concentration of H plus equals 10 to the minus pH. Now the 10 bit 
comes from pressing the shift button as you can see there and the log button and you can see on there so you've got a 10 with a little box so what will happen on your calculator is you get a 10 and this little box will start to flash uh, and in that box you put minus ph so what you've been given there which is 1.7 so let's put the figures in so h plus equals 10 to the minus 1.7 okay uh, and so therefore the concentration of h plus is 0.0 two zero moles per dm cubed now this calculator is a casio calculator it's probably one of the most well used calculators um you know it's one of the recommended ones for for a level and gcse so you more than likely you'll have this but if you don't um you're just looking for that 10 with a little box at the top okay right so we're going to look at how we can calculate the ph of strong acids so we've looked at an example there so we're going to categorize these and look at how we can calculate the ph of a strong acid so like we said before we've got to assume that strong acids dissociate fully okay for this to, to work this out so if we look at for example monoprotic acids first so for example if we look at hydrochloric acid and nitric acid H hcl and hno3 now monoprotic acids dissociate they produce one h plus ion for every molecule of acid so that means we can say that the concentration of h plus is um equals the concentration of the acid that we're using so that makes it quite straightforward because we can just chuck all that into our into our um uh, equation and um, we can work this out so for example we're going to work out the ph of 0.25 moles per dm cubed of hydrochloric acid um, we just use the concentration of the acid to work out the concentration of h plus so ph is 0.6. Okay, so diprotic acids. Uh, so, for example, um, sulfuric acid is a is an example here. Um, so, sulfuric acid is a diprotic acid because it contains two protons per molecule. So, um, they actually produce two uh, H pluses, like I say, for every acid molecule. So, this means the concentration of the acid is two times the concentration of H plus ions. Okay, so what this means is that when we're calculating it, we've got to take that into account. So, for example, if we're going to take the same strength sulfuric acid, so we're going to take the same strength, we're going to use sulfuric acid, then what we can say is the concentration of H plus ions, because we produce two of these for every acid molecule. So, this means that 0.25 mole per dm cubed of acid produces twice as much H plus ions. So, it's 0.5 mole per dm cubed of H plus ions. We've got to take that into account. Um, and so the pH is minus log 0.5, which gives the pH of 0.3. Again, both of these answers are sensible because both answers are given a pH that is um, acidic. So always check that. Always make sure the answers are sensible. Okay. So we're going to look at the calculating, uh, calculation of pH of strong bases instead. Okay. So this is actually quite similar to when we're calculating the pH of a strong acid. Um, we assume that a strong base will dissociate fully. Okay, so remember from the near the um, near the start of the video when we looked at that table, and I emphasised about um, equilibrium and where equilibrium lies, and and um, about the dissociation of it. And um, well, this is why it's really important. So um, let's have a look. So we've got an example here, which is sodium hydroxide. We assume that dissociates fully to form Na plus and OH minus. Okay. And so most strong bases dissociate to produce one OH minus ion for every base molecule. And so this means that the concentration of the base equals the concentration of OH minus ions. Okay, so very similar to acids. Now the main difference here is that actually we need to use that KW expression that we used here when we calculate the pH of strong bases. So to calculate the pH of a base, we still need the concentration of H+, because remember, our pH equation has that as a as part of the equation, is H+. So to, to get the con concentration of H+, we need to use the ionic product of water expression. So Kw equals the concentration of H+, times by the concentration of OH-. And so to work out the concentration of H+, we need to know Kw and we need to know the concentration of OH- at a specific temperature. And then once we've got that, we can then work out the concentration of H+. Okay, um, so, so let's look at an example. So we're going to calculate the pH 
of 0.15 mole per dm cubed of sodium hydroxide solution at 298 Kelvin. And remember, ionic product of water, Kw, has a value of 1 times by 10 to the minus 14 mole squared dm to the minus 6. So we've got Kw. Um, and we've obviously got the concentration of sodium hydroxide here. So we're going to use this assumption that it dissociate fully to work this out. So first we substitute the figures into our Kw expression. So you can see we've got our ionic product of water, which is here, which is Kw. That's it there. And then we've got our uh, concentration of OH minus ions of 0.15. Because we assume that the concentration of your sodium hydroxide will equal the concentration of OH minus ions. So we put that in there. Then once we've worked that out, we then need to rearrange the equation, okay, to work out the concentration of H plus. Um, so in this case, it's 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 0 0.15. And that's going to get us the concentration of H plus to be 6.67 times by 10 to the minus 14. Now, once we've worked that out, we use our pH expression that we've seen before. There it is. So pH equals minus log 6.67 times by 10 to the minus 14. So we get a pH of 13.18. Again, check to make sure that that is sensible, which it is because this is a... Um, this is a base, um, and so um, bases are. This is a strong base, so you'd expect a strong base to be somewhere in the region of 13 or 14. This one is exactly in that region, so this is a, a sensible answer. If you're getting something like one or two for this type of question, then clearly you know you're not, uh, um, you haven't got that right. So you're not anywhere near that. So make sure you, you know have a look at the number, make sure it looks sensible. Okay. So we're going to look at Ka. Okay, which is the acid dissociation constant. Don't get this confused with KC or KW. Okay, so this one is where we're actually going to use Ka to work out the pH of weak acids. And the reason why we need to use this is because weak acids actually only dissociate slightly. Um, so we have to use this Ka constant to work out their pH values. Okay, so where we can assume the concentration of H plus equals the concentration of the acid for strong acids, that's the assumption we can make. For weak acids, we just can't do that because that isn't the case. So we need to use this Ka equilibrium constant, uh, dissociation constant, sorry, to, to work this out. So remember, weak acids um, have this uh, equilibrium system here, but the equilibrium lies well over to the left here. We have loads of undissociated acid in our solution. We don't have many of these at all. Okay, so this is why we're going to have to use a Ka expression. So... The first assumption is that only a small amount of the weak acid dissociates. So we can assume that the concentration of the acid at equilibrium equals, or is, a, is approximately equal, to the concentration of the acid at the start. So whatever the figures we've been given, we can assume that of the acid right at the start, we can assume it's probably going to be the same um, at equilibrium. So that's the first thing. And so the equilibrium law um, obviously can be applied here as we have an equilibrium reaction. So we can use the Ka expression to represent this reaction. So let's have a look what this looks like. So there we are. So Ka is just a, another form of equilibrium constant, but it's to do with weak acids. So you can see that our weak acid dissociates to produce H plus and A minus. These are your products. So these go on the top line. Our reactant goes on the bottom. Um, and so that sits there. And obviously Ka, how we have our units of moles per dm cubed, for acid dissociation constant. And the second assumption that we make is that the dissociation of the acid is greater than the dissociation of water present in solution. And so we can assume that any H plus ions that are in that solution has actually come from the acid and not from the water. So for that reason, we can assume that the concentration of H plus is about the same as the concentration of A minus. Okay, so from that, we can actually here we go again. We can simplify our equation. So here it is here. So we simplify our K expression to this. So you can see instead of having K A H plus and A minus at the top, we can actually combine these and form a H plus squared because we assume that the concentration of H plus and A minus is approximately the same. And obviously um, we divide that by HA, which is the concentration of our acid. So that's all the same. Okay, so I'm um, just a word of warning um, for this bit. Um, you'll see later um, we use um, buffers, or we're going to look at uh, buffer solutions and, and how we calculate them. Um, you can use, you have to use this expression when using buffers, okay? So when you're calculating um, 
weak acids, just the pH of a weak acid on its own, there's no mention of a buffer, then we use this expression here. So we can make this assumption here. So we can't use this for buffers, but you'll see later when we look at buffers towards the end of the video. Okay, so let's have a look at see how we can actually calculate the, um, the pH of the weak acid then. And obviously we are going to use the K expression that we've seen there before to work it out. So let's have a look at an example question. So we can see, let's calculate the pH of 0 0.03 moles per dm cubed of ethanoic acid at 298 Kelvin. And the Ka for ethanoic acid is 298 Kelvin, um, is 1.76 times by 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeters cubed. Okay, so unlike, obviously we've done it with a strong acid, where we can make the assumption that the concentration of acid equals the concentration of H+. Plus. Obviously, we can't do it with our weak acid. So let's use this Ka expression. The first thing we need to do is write it down. So Ka equals H plus squared divided by the concentration of ethanoic acid. So that's a weak acid, remember? It's a carboxylic acid. Okay, so secondly, we need to rearrange that equation to calculate the concentration of H plus squared. So really simply, we take H plus squared equals Ka, concentration of our ethanoic acid, so we've rearranged it, Put in the numbers 1.76 times 10 to the minus 5, which is this bit here, uh, times by 0 0.0300, and um, this is the concentration of ethanoic acid. Uh, that's going to get his concentration of H plus squared of 5.28 times by 10 to the minus 7. Now, one of the key things here um, is that we've got uh, H plus squared, but um, the problem is that this is a squared function. Now, a lot of people and it's a it's a common mistake where people will forget to do the square root of that to actually get the pH. So we need to do the square root first to just get the concentration of H+. plus. So there it is there. So we calculate the concentration of H+, plus by taking the square root of H plus squared, and that gets us 7.27 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeters cubed. So now we've got a concentration of H+, plus, we can now bring in our pH equation to work out pH. So we put it in there. So we calculate pH. pH equals minus log of H plus. Put your numbers in and we get a pH of 3.14. Again, you know, make sure that is actually sensible. In this case, it is because we're obviously dealing with ethanoic acid, which is a weak acid. So we would expect a pH, quite a strong weak acid, but we'd expect a pH certainly not 1 or 2. Um, we're looking at about 3.14 in this case. Okay, so you can see it's not too bad. The key thing here is write down your Ka expression first. Then once you've wrote, written that down, work out H+. Plus. But remember to do the square root bit. That's the critical bit. That's the critical bit there, which is this bit over on the on the left hand side there. Okay. Okay. So um, let's use or calculate in the Ka or concentration of a weak acid. So we're going to kind of do it backwards. So we're going to use the Ka expression to calculate Ka or the concentration of a weak acid so we can do that so let's have a look at this example so we've got to calculate the concentration in moles per dm cubed of methanoic acid at 298 kelvin with a ph of 3.14 and the ka for methanoic acid is 298 kelvin is 1.77 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeters cubed okay so Let's have a look. So the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate the concentration of H plus using the pH equation, okay? Because we've been given the pH. So let's do this. So we've got to calculate the concentration of H plus. So we rearrange the equation, remember, to get concentration of H plus, and we use this 10 to the minus pH. So we put our pH in there, 3.14, because that's what we've been given, and then we get the concentration of H plus here, which is 7.24 times by 10 to the minus 4. And so then what we need to do, because we're going to work out um, we're going to work out the concentration of methanoic acid, so we need to bring up our K expression. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to write down our K expression. Ka equals H plus squared divided by the concentration of your methanoic acid. So this is the bit, remember, that we want to work out. It's this bit here. So we have to rearrange this equation to make that the subject, and therefore we get this. So we get rearranged the equation, uh, and we get the concentration of our methanoic acid equals H plus squared divided by Ka. We just worked out H plus here, so we're going to put that there and square it, 
and then 1.77 is the value of Ka, which is what we've been given here. So then we put all that in and we get our concentration of our weak acid to be 2.96 times by 10 to the minus 3. Now, obviously, if we're going to work out Ka, because we can also work out Ka, um, Ka is even easier because all we have to do is we'll be given the concentration of a weak acid, and obviously we've worked that bit out, so we just put the figures in and just work out Ka. So we don't actually need to, um, we don't actually need to rearrange it at all, so calculating Ka is even easier. Okay, so obviously we've looked at pH here, and pH is a measure of acidity. Um, there's another way of measuring acidity, and that's something called pKa. Okay, so pK is just another way of measuring the strength of an acid, except we're using um, we're using Ka instead of the concentration of H plus. Okay, so this is the pKa expression. So pKa equals minus log of Ka. Now notice, here's the clue here. P, you say pK and pH. P is minus log, and that's how you can remember it. So um, pH is the minus log of H plus signs, that's where pH comes from, and pKa is the minus log of Ka, so pK. So you can see what we're going to have to do here is calculate the pK value for an acid with a Ka value of 7.52 times by 10 to the minus 3 moles per dm cubed. Very, very straightforward. pKa is minus log of Ka. We substitute, obviously, the Ka value of 7.52 times by 10 to the minus 3, and we get a pKa value of 2.12, okay? We can also do the inverse, of course, because we can do the inverse of a pH, so we can do the inverse of pKa, and it's exactly the same. It's just 10 to the minus pKa, except in this one, okay? So let's have a look at an example. So we want to calculate the pH of 0 0.0250 moles per dm cubed of ethanoic acid at 298 Kelvin, which has a pKa value of 4.75 at 298 Kelvin, okay? So, first of all, we're going to calculate Ka. So, Ka equals 10 to the minus pKa. Ka equals 10 to the minus 4.75 because that's the value of our, um, that's the pKa value. Um, and then we're going to put that into our calculator and get a figure of 1.78 times by 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeters cubed. And so, that's your Ka value. Then, because we need to work out pH, remember, um, so we've got our Ka value, we then need to use the Ka expression to calculate the concentration of H+. So we've got Ka equals H plus squared over concentration of ethanoic acid. So H plus squared equals Ka times by the concentration of ethanoic acid will give you uh, 1.78 times 10 to the minus 5 times by 0 0.0250. That's all your numbers. We've got a value of H plus squared there. We need to square root it, remember, because we need to just get H squared, uh, H plus, sorry, concentration of H plus, uh, and that's going to give us 6.67 times by 10 to the minus 4. We're still not finished yet because we still need to work out the pH, so we bring our pH equation back in here. There it is. So pH equals the minus log to the um, minus log of the base 10 of H plus, and we get a pH of 3.18. Again, um, check to see if that's sensible. It is. This is ethanoic acid. It's a weak acid, so we'd expect it to have, um, you know, a pH. Certainly not a pH of one or two. Um, so you know, this is a three point one eight. So this is this is probably what we'd expect. Yes. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at some titrations because it's obviously we're doing acid base, um, acid base equilibria. So um, we can't really do acid base equilibria without doing titrations because titrations allow us to get these figures that we see here, the concentrations, etc. Titrations allow us to get these, and then these titrations then allow us to work out pH, etc. So there's going to be, um, obviously, sort of a reminder of how you do a titration as well, but you would have done this in year one, you would probably be sick of titrations. Um, and we're also then going to use that and actually enhance it and look at things like indicators um, and, and um, neutralization points, half neutralization points, etc. So we're really going to focus in on what we can do with the titration. So as you can see, there is a titration and they're used to work out the concentration of an acid or base. So just as a reminder, so remember we have an acid or base in the burette with a known concentration in the in the burette there at the top so depending on what we're using and then in the bottom we have an acid or a base depending on what we're using and um, with an unknown concentration 
but we have a known volume in that conical flask. And what we do is we add a few drops of indicator in there as well so that we can um, see the end point. Okay, so then what we do is we add the chemical into the burette, uh, from the burette into the conical flask until that indicator changes color. When the indicator changes color, this means we've hit an end point. And um, what we need to do is add it drop by drop near the end point because one drop can make a big difference to the actual pH, as you're going to see later on in some of the graphs that we're going to show. The um, you know the the method when you get near the end point is critical. So we add it drop by drop. Okay. So remember when we've when we add it, we then need to measure. We need to read how much we've actually added in from our burette. And remember when you're reading it, um, is we need to read from the bottom of the meniscus. Okay. We don't read from the top. So you can see here, there's the bottom of the meniscus there. Okay, so this is reading um, this is reading 20 centimeters cubed, not 19.8. Okay, so we've actually got 19 there. We're not reading from the top of the meniscus, we read from the bottom. That's very, very, very important. So once we've read that, really what we've got to do is record our results to two decimal places, um, and we've got to repeat them until we get two results that are concordant. That must mean that they're within 0.1 centimeters cubed of each other if they're not then you can't be sure of what your actual result is so for example if you get results that are 20 centimeters cubed 22 centimeters cubed 21 and 24 you know you're not actually getting anywhere near you're not actually getting anywhere near the actual value okay um it's a nice cream van <laughs> it's actually not sunny either um it's quite cloudy i don't think he's going to get uh, much uh, much trade today anyway um right <laughs> so let's get back to titrations uh take your mind off ice creams right so we're going to look at um some titration curves here okay so remember how how we did the um how we did the titration so following the following graph shows ph against volume of base added from a titration so we've got our base in our burette and we're adding that to an acid okay so the acid is in the conical flask for all these examples and what we're going to show is different combinations of weak acid and strong acid and uh, strong bases and weak bases. So we're going to show and see what happens. Now the classic curve, um, uh, the classic shape of a, of a titration, so they say titration graph, titration graph is the curve. It's like an S-shaped curve. And we're going to look at what they are. Now you need to be able to identify these, you know, what type of combination of chemicals we've used just by looking at the graph. Okay, now it's fairly straightforward. It sounds horrendous, but it's actually fairly straightforward. So let's have a look at the first one. So this first graph here is when we add a strong acid, strong base. Now you can see here that the graph starts at pH 1 because we're using a strong acid, so it's a really low one. We add our base gradually, and then it shoots up very, very quickly at a sudden point, um, and then obviously the solution then becomes um, basic overall. So we've got a strong base, so it's um, up towards pH 14. So a strong acid weak base, um, this one again we're starting at pH 1 or somewhere around there because it's a strong acid, but because we're using a weak base, it's not going to rise as high as the other one did. So it's going to end up somewhere around our pH 8 or 9 because a weak base is being used. We still have this S-shaped curve though, that still exists. Okay, so if we use a weak acid strong base, so weak acid, so it starts a lot higher up the curve. That's a classic sign of a weak acid. Still have this classic S-shaped curve. Um, we've got a weak base. So we have a strong base here. So therefore, the graph is going to end up somewhere in 13 or 14, somewhere towards the top there, okay, because we have an excess. And then the last one is a weak acid, weak base. Um, clearly, um, it starts quite high up the curve because we've got a weak acid, and it doesn't really rise that much because we've got a weak base. So the differential between the pH of the two isn't really that dramatic. So the S shape is less pronounced compared to some of these examples there. Okay, so still remaining on titration curves. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at specific features of these curves and we're actually going to um, see if we can try and identify what they mean and what the parts of these curves mean. So you need to be able to comment on these as well. So here we've got our axes here and we're going to look at um, the same graph that we've seen before. We've seen a set of four of them. So we're going to make a bigger one and look at some of the specific features. So what you can first determine is we've got this S shape. And so in the middle, we have a vertical bit. 
It's a very sharp vertical point, and this is the equivalence point or the end point. And it's at this point that your acid has actually been neutralized fully by the base. Okay, so we've got no more acid or H plus ions remaining in the solution, and therefore we have a sharp vertical rise because we've got a very dramatic change in pH from uh, um, H plus ions reacting in full, um, and we have an excess of OH minus ions at this point. So we can see the change in the pH is smallest when we use a weak acid and a weak base um, together in a titration. So it's not the best type of um, titration to use. Okay. Um, also, um, obviously, this one's a strong acid, strong base. They're the best ones because you get the sharpest endpoint. Um, it can also go the other way as well. So we can actually start with a strong, say, like a strong base in our uh, conical flask, and we can add an acid to it. The difference is, is that the graph will actually go down like this instead. So let's bring that up and see what it looks like. There it is. Okay. So we can do it the other way around. It doesn't make any difference. The rules still stand. So just be prepared that you might see it the other way around. It depends on what's in your conical flask and what's in your burette. Okay. So we have another point in this graph. Now this is a little bit strange, but I'm going to try and explain it the best way that I can because I think the confusing bit is well, what's the difference between an end point and something called a half neutralization point. Um, so the half neutralization point is the point halfway between zero and the equivalence point, which is the bit, the vertical bit. So um, which is this bit here. And it's actually this bit. We can use this to calculate the pK of a weak acid by taking the pH at this point. And we obviously we use a, a pH meter to do that. Now I'm going to try and explain. Um, <laughs> I hope this analogy works reasonably well. But what I'm going to try and do is explain um, the difference between uh, an end point and a half or an uh, end point and a half neutralization point. So imagine you've got a hall and in that hall you've got a hundred people lining up in that hall. Okay. Um, we are going to send in um, 50 people to pair up with um, 50 people in the hall. So you've got a hundred in the hall and 50 of them will be paired up. Now what you have is you have 50 that's paired up and you have 50 that's not paired up. So imagine this is a bit like H plus signs in the hall, OH minus of people coming in, okay? So some of them will react. And so what we have is we have what we call a half neutralization point. So this is the point when half of the H plus signs have reacted with the OH minus signs that we are um, adding into this um, titration. So we still have half left. Now, if we keep adding people into the hall, then um, we still have 50 people left over, remember, in the hall. Then eventually, um, you know, these 50 people in the hall will be paired up and paired up and paired up and paired up. And let's say all 100 are now paired up. Okay, so we're kind of like at this point here, round about here, all 50 are paired up and we add another um, person into there. Okay, so that's like another OH minus sign. All of a sudden, you've got an imbalance. You've now got a hall that's got more OH minus in than it has H plus. And so effectively in a titration that means we get a very sharp rise in ph and that goes right up here because all of a sudden we haven't got any more h pluses left to pair up with the oh minus so the oh minus is just kind of floating around and um, not reacting with anything and so the overall effect is we get a solution that's basic overall because there is no h plus signs in there so that's the main difference between the equivalence point so at the equivalence point um, we have no H plus ions left. They've all reacted. But at the half neutralization point, the amount of H plus ions is the same as the amount of uh, OH minus ions that were added. So we've got an equal, um, we've got an, uh, an equal amount in here. Okay, so it's it's kind of like that that type of analogy. It kind of helps a little bit. So back onto chemistry. So at this point. Like I say, we can say that the concentration of HA, that's our acid, is equal to the concentration of um, A minus. Okay, so that was the the um, acid that was dissociated. That's where that comes from, is the A minus. Um, well, it, it comes from the salt actually that's formed and it dissociates. So, what we could say, anyway, what we could say is the Ka equals the concentration of H plus times by the concentration of A minus. Okay, and so um, divide that by the concentration of HA. So remember, that's our Ka expression. Now, as the concentration of HA and the concentration of A minus is the same, what we can do is actually uh, cancel them out. And so that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to cancel them out there. Okay, um, and then we're left with 
that Ka equals the concentration of H+. plus. Okay, so then what we can do, we can actually take the minus log of both sides of this. There we are, okay. So we take the minus log of both sides. Now, this may look a little bit more familiar to you. So the minus log of H plus is pH, and the minus log of Ka is pKa. So what we can say is pK equals pH. So it's at this point, if we take the pH at this point here, whatever the pH is, we draw the line across, then we can actually work out the pK. And if we know pK, we can then work out Ka, and then, and then so on and so forth. So we can actually work out a lot from this part here. Okay, so it wouldn't be a titration without an indicator. So we need to use an indicator for this type of reaction. Now what, you're, what you should be able to do is you need to be able to determine the proper indicator to use. You've got to choose the correct one depending on the titration that you're actually doing. So let's have a look. So an indicator to work, it must change in that vertical bit there. Okay, so it must change there um, and um, the, the color change must happen there and because that the indicate the whole point of the indicator is to help us determine where the end point is so we want it to change within the end point of that graph. Now you can see in this example uh, we must choose an indicator that changes color between a pH range of 3 and 10. Okay, um, anything that deviates outside of that range then obviously we can't work out the, uh, the pH. I can't work out the end point. So, variety of different indicators that we can use. However, the two most common ones are methyl orange and phenolphthalein. They're just two most common um, uh, indicators to use in this titration. So, you can see here that methyl orange will change in pH 3 to pH 4.5. That's the scope for methyl orange. So, it's actually red, um, obviously red at low pHs and yellowy, like a yellowy orange. Um, at, at higher pHs, and another one is phenolphthalein, which changes at 8.2 to 10. Okay, now you can see that methyl orange, like I say, is red at low pH and yellow at high pH, and this is ideal for titrations where you're doing a strong acid, strong base titration, or a strong acid, weak base titration, because the end point will fall between that pH range. But for phenolphthalein, um, it's colorless at low pH and pink at high pH values. So this is perfectly um, used for things like weak acid, strong bases. Now there's one that's missing here, and that's your weak acid, weak base um, titration. So um, it's these titrations are really difficult um, to actually use because the change, that, that, that vertical bit is very short. Um, so there's no real sharp pH change with them types of titrations. So it's best to avoid them. Um, but really, the only way to identify an endpoint is just by um, putting a pH probe into the uh, conical flask, uh, plotting your results on the graph, and then just seeing it on the graph where your endpoint is. It's really difficult to use a um, to use a um, uh, use an indicator to identify this. Okay. So still on the topic of titrations, we're going to look at calculations okay so this is just a reminder of how we actually um, conduct the titration calculations and remember the equivalence point is the point where neutralization occurs and we use that pH meter to to find that so this is just a reminder you would have seen this in year one chemistry but it is important because you are you know you are gonna uh, need to know about this for for year two for year two chemistry as well because clearly it's all about titrations so let's have a look at an example so we've got 15.7 centimeters cubed of 0.45 mol per diem cubed of sulfuric acid was required to neutralize 0 0.120 moles per diem cubed of sodium hydroxide. And we need to calculate the volume of sodium hydroxide being neutralized in centimeters cubed. So the first thing we need to do is we need to write out our equation. So we've got sulfuric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide, forming our salt, which is sodium sulfate, as you can see there, and water. Now, in this case, we're going to put sulfuric acid in our burette um, and we're going to put sodium hydroxide in our conical flask in the bottom here. So we're adding sulfuric acid in there. So the next thing is we need to calculate the number of moles of sulfuric acid. Um, so um, moles, remember, is concentration times volume. So that's from year one chemistry. Uh, moles is 0 0.45, which is the concentration. There it is. Okay, times by 15.7 centimeters cubed now notice i if you've seen my other videos I, I normally do this where i just put times 10 to the minus 3 
on the end because what we have to do is convert our volume to decimeters cubed so remember that so i find it a bit easier just to put times 10 to the minus 3 on the end because that means exactly the same thing as divide by a thousand okay so what we're going to do here is calculate the number of moles of sulfuric acid which is 7.07 .07 times by 10 to the minus 3. So we've worked out how many moles are in here. So now, once we've done that, we can then use this molar equation to work out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. And I use the saying, again, if you know my videos, you know what I say, if in doubt, work out the moles, because the moles can tell you a lot of things. You can work out a lot of things by knowing the moles. So we are going to use that equation. So this is the stoichiometry, as they call it. So it's a one to two ratio between sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid. So that means we've got number of moles of sodium hydroxide is twice the number of moles of sulfuric acid. So as you can see there, so we've got two moles of sodium hydroxide per sulfuric acid. So the amount of moles of sodium hydroxide is going to be two times the number of moles of acid, which is 0.0141 moles. Okay, so now we've worked out the moles, we can then use that to uh, calculate the um, volume using volume equals moles divided by concentration now you can see here we've got volume and decimeters cubed moles divided by concentration is moles per decimeters cubed we put the um, put the uh, figures in there and we get a, a volume in decimeters cubed of um, 0 0.118 decimeters cubed and then to work it out in centimeters cubed um, we need to multiply by a thousand to get to 118 centimeters cubed. So obviously that should say multiply. So you definitely multiply by a thousand and that will get it from the uh, the decimeters cubed into centimeters cubed that we need to work it out with. So make sure you're calculating it to the correct units. That's very, very important. Okay, so let's look at some um, another titration curve. So I told you there's a lot on titrations here, um, but this is gonna be a diprotic titration curve now this is a little bit strange okay um because it gives a funny shape now normally we've just seen that s shape that we've seen there with a nice single uh, vertical rise but with these type of ones they actually have um two rises in them so um diprotic acids they release two which is diprotons which is protic when they dissociate in solution okay so ethane dioic acid let's look at this one is an example of a diprotic acid um, and this, when it reacts with a base such as potassium hydroxide, is actually neutralized in two steps. The reason why it's a diprotic acid is because we've got two H plus signs um, coming off. So we've got two carboxylic acids. We've got one here and we've got one there. Okay, so it's diprotic. So the reason, um, like I say, the two, uh, two protons are actually released separately from the acid molecule i.e., they don't leave at the same time so when we neutralize this um first of all out of all these molecules in the solution this hydrogen will come off first let's say this one will remain this one will only come off once all the molecules have lost this proton here okay so it happens in two stages so as a consequence what we get is we get two equivalence points um, just when you thought one was enough we get two with this one so we get one for each proton that's dissociated and you can see we've got the two steps there on the graph so let's look at this first rise so this is actually the first equivalence point shows the oh minus ions from the base reacting with the first proton so you can see here there's our molecule there and um, we've got our oh minus ion we're going to remove one of the protons one still on there remember and we're going to form water so this is the first bit of neutralization that happens at this point it'll then start to level out again a little bit okay and then it'll keep on going until we've got the second rise here so the second equivalence point and this is actually showing that the oh minus ions reacting with the second proton so this is what we had from the previous reaction here we had more oh minus ions and that finally removes the second proton from there to form water now we uh, water as well as produced now we don't get any further steps because we don't have any more protons so we fully neutralized our our uh, diprotic um, acid here okay so that's pretty much it for for titration curves you see there's a lot on there about titration so we're just going to move swiftly onto um buffers which is probably one of the most difficult parts i think of this topic uh, i'll try and explain it as best as i can um but it's the final bit of the of the video is looking at um buffers and their calculations of course so 
um, we're just going to have a bit of an introduction to buffers first because we need to know how a buffer works. So a buffer is basically a chemical that resists the change in pH when small amounts of acid or base are added. Remember, it's just resist. It doesn't actually stop the change in pH. It just resists it. So you're not going to add loads of amount, like large amounts of chemical and it's going to stop the change. Okay, it's resist. That's very important. There are two types of buffer that we need to know. One's an acidic buffer and one's a basic buffer. Okay, so we're going to look at both examples. So let's look at acidic buffers first. So an acidic buffer is something that resists the change in pH in order to keep the solution below pH 7. And so they're made from a weak acid and its salt. Okay. Now the key thing with buffers um, is to um, understand how a buffer is made and how it works. And to do that, you're going to have to understand equilibria. Okay. And you're going to have to understand Le Chatelier's principle to understand this. So we are going to look at an example here. I'm going to try and talk through it as, as carefully as I possibly can because I think if you understand this bit, you're really going to, um, you know, it's going to help you massively to do the calculations which are worth, you know, a healthy number of marks. So here's an example of an acidic buffer. So we're going to use ethanoic acid as the weak acid and we're going to use sodium ethanoate as its salt. So in any buffer solution, there are two equilibrium equations at play and we've got two equations that actually coexist in the same beaker so we're going to write two equations down and both of these equations exist in the same beaker okay so here's the first one so remember to make a buffer we need a weak acid so weak acids we know have this set up here we have a weak acid and we it's in equilibrium with um obviously at the uh ethanoate in this case it's ethanoic acid so it's the ethanoate ion and the h plus ion and we know that weak acids dissociate weakly so equilibrium is well over to the left hand side so we've got high amounts of this a high concentration of this and not much of these two okay so nothing new there we've seen that already okay so here's the next one so we've got our salt. Remember, we need um, a, a buffer is made by using a weak acid and its salt. It must be the salt of the acid that we're using. So you can see here, there's our salt, sodium ethanoate. This is going to dissociate to form our ion and it's gonna, we're going to form our Na+. Now, salts associate a dissociate fully. Okay, so they're strong dissociators. So what that means is equilibrium is well over to the right. So we've got very, very, very little, if anything, of this, but loads of this and loads of this. Okay, so as long as you get that bit, that's fine. Okay, so there's nothing new there. We know about equilibrium and we know about dissociation of salts. They dissolve readily, so they dissociate fully. And we know that weak acids uh, equilibrium lies well to the left. Okay, so nothing new there. So once we've got this understanding of both of them, we can now put them all together. So a buffer is what we're going to do is basically going to, um, I suppose, model this buffer. And we're going to try and not literally model it, but you know what I mean, like put it on a catwalk. Um, we're actually going to model it. And we're going to say what happens when we add an acid and what happens when we add a base. You know, what's the impact on this buffer and what's actually happening to the um, equations in this buffer. So let's have a look. So first of all, we're going to see what happens when we add H plus ion to this buffer. So the H plus ions, they actually react with the ethanoate ion. So that's this here, CH3COO minus. Now we have loads of these here. That's why we have our salt. So we've got loads of these and the H plus will react with that. And it will form this, obviously. So if we add a H plus on there, it'll form that. So equilibrium will effectively shift to the left. Now you might think, well, hang on, you're going from one equation to the other. Remember I said that these coexist in the same beaker. So we'll write them side by side like this, one top the other, and we can interchange between them. Okay, so let's have a look. Oh, so you can see here there's a high concentration of these from the salt. And when we add the H+, we get more of this is produced. So essentially equilibrium is shifting to the left because we've drawn our arrow to the left, as you can see on there. Okay, so we get large amounts, so we get loads of the acid, but that's fine. We can add H plus ions, and we've got a good supply of these, a plentiful supply of these, so that's fine. Obviously, if we add too much of this, then it'll overwhelm this, but, um, you know, it'll still work. So what happens if we add a base? So we're adding hydroxide ions. Now, have a think about it. Which species do you think the hydroxide ion would react with? 
Well, in this case, the hydroxide ion would react with the H plus ions. This is over here, because remember, that's negatively charged. So that's going to react with something that's positively charged, isn't it? Now, you might think, well, hang on, what about this here? Well, yes, it will react with the sodium plus, because that's a positive charge as well, and there's loads of it. But when you think that's sodium, what do you think you'll form when you react sodium with the hydroxide? You'll form sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide is a strong base. And what do we know about strong bases? They dissociate fully. So they break back down into Na plus and OH minus, so we're back to square one. So actually the reaction that we're really interested in here is the OH minus ions reacting with the um, with the H plus ions, which is, uh, which is on here, okay? Now you might think, well, hang on, there's not many of these, so it wouldn't take many of these to overwhelm that. Well, actually, this is where Le Chatelier comes in. So remember, um, there's a low concentration of these. However, they can be reproduced because we've got a high concentration of these weak acids here. So if we if we use up some of these, equilibrium will immediately think, oh, we've, we're running low on these H plus ions, so we need to replenish the stock. So we replenish it by dissociating more of these molecules to replace the H plus ions that have reacted. So we've got Le Chatelier's principle. So make sure when you're describing how a buffer works, that you're in a position to um, explain what happens. So effectively, the equilibrium obviously shifts to the right. So all these words that you can see in here, these descriptions, you need to be familiar with them. You need to be talking about equilibrium, shifting to the right, loss of H plus ions, low concentration, high concentration, salt. Use all these keywords in your exam and you'll be absolutely fine, okay? So the mechanics of this buffer is very very important okay so make sure you understand it so we're now going to look at a basic buffer and the principle is the same except we're going to use a base instead and a basic buffer is designed to keep the solution above pH 7 and so they're made from their weak base and its salt okay so exactly the same principle so here's an example of a weak base remember we looked at this earlier on in the video a weak base is an ammonia molecule uh, and its salt is ammonium chloride and so we're going to do exactly the same. Um, we've got two equilibrium equations. They coexist in the same beaker, exactly the same as your acid buffer. So here they are here. Here's our weak base dissociation first. So remember, it's a weak base. It needs water, remember, to produce the OH minus ions. So we've got loads of this ammonia here because it's a weak base, and we haven't got many of the ions there. Okay, Equilibrium's lying well over to the left. And so let's look at the salt. And remember, salts dissociate fully because they're salts, so um, this is ammonium chloride, it breaks down into ammonium ion and chloride ion, so we've got high amounts of these and low amounts of that, so equilibrium lies well over to the right. And now we're going to do exactly the same as what we did with the acid uh, buffer, so we're going to test it or model it using different species. So first, what happens when we add a base or OH minus ion to this buffer? What do you think it's going to react with? Well, it's a negative charge, so it's the only thing which is positive there is the ammonium ion. And so that's exactly what it'll react with. So the O minus, OH minus will react with the ammonium ions in solution. Thankfully, we've got loads of these from the salt. So we can have a high concentration of these uh, from the salt. And equilibrium, once we react the OH with the NH4+, plus, if you break that up, that breaks down into these two molecules over here. So equilibrium shifts to the left and we produce more NH3 and H2O, so that shifts to the left. Okay, so see if we can do this one. So what happens when we add H plus ions to the buffer? What do you think it's going to react with? Okay, so it's going to react with something negative, isn't it? Now you might think, okay, well, I've got no H minus there, and I've got a Cl minus. Okay, so let's start with the Cl minus. So if I react the H with the Cl minus, I'm going to get HCl. What do we know about HCl? It's a strong acid. What do strong acids do? They dissociate. So this will then break straight back down to H plus and Cl minus again. So we're back to square one. So this would actually react with the OH minus that's in solution that's produced from the ammonium. Now, again, same principle. We haven't got many of these, but that's fine. Um, we've got an equilibrium system here. So this is effectively going to dissociate to replace the OH minus ions that you've reacted with. So this is Le Chatelier's principle again, and it's there to counteract the change. So if we remove or reduce the concentration of OH minus ions, equilibrium will shift to replace them. Okay, so equilibrium here shifts to the right um, as the OH minus ions are replaced. 
Okay, so see if you've got the hang of them buffers. Once you understand the mechanics of it, then um, the calculations become a little bit easier, okay? Because this starts the difficult bit, is understanding that. So now, we're going to look at some of the calculations. And so the first one, we're actually going to calculate the pH of a buffer. And so to calculate this, we need to know the Ka value, and we need to know the concentration of the weak acid and its salt. So, let's have a look. Calculate the pH of a buffer that contains 2.35 times by 10 to the minus 2 moles of methanoic acid, 1.84 times, times by 10 to the minus 2 moles of sodium meth methanoate in a 1 decimeter cubed solution. The value of Ka at 25 degrees Celsius for methanoic acid is 1.78 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeter cubed. All right. So the first thing we need to do with this um, is we need to work out, um, well, we need to write down our K expression first. So we're going to write down our K expression. So here's our overall equation here, okay? Overall equation, ionic equation. Our K expression is H plus methanoate ion divided by methanoic acid. So that's our K expression, okay? So then remember, um, in buffers, we can't assume that the concentration of H plus equals the concentration of A minus. So we can't use that H plus squared. Remember what I said earlier in the video, we've got to use the, the full Ka expression for this, okay? Um, and then therefore we must use equilibrium concentrations in here, not initial concentrations, that's very important. However, what we can assume um, is salts dissociate fully, and so um, weak acids dissociate poorly. So we assume that the concentration of the salt equals the concentration of A minus. So we assume that all of these A minuses are coming from the salt and are not coming from the acid because we assume it dissociates poorly. And we assume that the concentration of the acid, because it dissociates poorly, we assume that the concentration of the acid at the start is just going to be about the same at equilibrium because it doesn't dissociate very well. So these are the assumptions that we're making here. So once we've done that, we then need to rearrange that expression to get the concentration of H+. So concentration of H+, equals Ka times by the concentration of methanoic acid, which is here, as you can see, there it is, uh, divided by methanoate ion, the concentration of methanoate ion. Okay, so remember these equations from the previous slide. So you can see we have a number of uh, molecules, oh, so we have, we have the number of moles in the question, so remember we're being given the number of moles here, but we need concentrations, this is what we need here. So remember, to work out the concentration of each of the species, we need to do moles divided by volume, we can't just put moles in here, okay? But on, in this example, we're having a, a solution of a decimeters cubed, so if we take each of these moles here, moles of methanoic acid, moles of the sodium methanoate, then we can and divide them by one, we're just going to get the same, okay? But you've got to remember to convert that into concentration. So we're going to put our numbers in here. So we're going to calculate H plus, okay? So remember, we want to work out the pH, so we need to know H plus. So H plus is 1.78 times by 10 to the minus 4, because that's our um, Ka, multiplied by the concentration of methanoic acid, and divided by the concentration of methanoate. Remember, these methanoate ions have come from our salt, sodium methanoate, okay, because that dissociates fully. So therefore, concentration is going to be 2.27 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeter cubed. So now we've got the concentration of H+, plus. we can then finally calculate the pH. So pH equals minus log of H+, plus. so pH is minus log, times by 2.27 times by 10 to the minus 4, and we get a pH of 3.64. Again, make sure that's sensible. This is a weak base, uh, weak acid, sorry, weak acid buffer. So a pH of 3.64 is certainly going to be a sensible answer. Okay, I hope you got that, because we're probably going to go into one of the most uh, complicated calculations um, in the whole of A-level chemistry, I think, um, and this is calculating the pH change of a buffer. Now, it doesn't have to be complicated, and what makes it simpler is if you know how a buffer works. Just remember, obviously, them, uh, them equations that we looked at before, how you make an acidic buffer and a basic buffer. So let's have a look um, um, at what these types of calculations are. And this is basically when we're adding a small amount of an acid or a base to a buffer, and we need to calculate the change in pH. Okay, so we've got the buffer. 
and we're going to add a small amount of an acid in there and we're going to see what is the new pH of that buffer because it will change it just won't change much it only resists the change remember okay so we use the usual assumptions assumptions from the previous slide okay are you ready for it here we go don't worry we'll work through it so here's the first question so calculate the pH change so we're going to add 10 centimeters cubed of one mole dilute uh, so one mole hydrochloric acid and is added to a decimeters cubed of buffer solution and that solution is made up of 0.1 moles of ethanoic acid mol moles per dm cubed of ethanoic acid and 0.1 moles per dm cubed of sodium methanoate so there's our salt and weak acid okay so that's fine so this has a pH of 4.73 so that's the pH of the buffer and we've got the value of Ka at 25 degrees Celsius for ethanoic acid is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5. Right, so the first thing we need to do here um, is we need to uh, calculate the number of moles of ethanoic acid. Remember the saying that I say, if in doubt, work out the moles. So calculate the number of moles of ethanoic acid, its salt and hydrochloric acid before the mix. So if we just get everything set on the table first and see what we've got, okay? So remember, moles is concentration times volume, okay? And the volume must be in decimeters cubed. So here, we're going to have 0 0.1 moles of acid, ethanoic acid, uh, one, 0 0.1 moles of sodium ethanoate, and we've got um, 0 0.01 moles of hydrochloric acid. So that's the strong acid that we're adding in there, okay? So we've got all our moles, so that's fine. Now, the reason why we have to work out moles is we need to work out the change. So you need to follow this bit very, very carefully, okay? So try and explain it as much as we can because it's the tricky bit. It's always the ones in the red box which are tricky, aren't they? Um, right, so when we add the strong acid, okay? So we've imagined, we've imagined we've got a massive flask of buffer. We've got a decimeters cubed of buffer, okay? That's a litre, okay? So imagine like a, a litre bottle, yeah, full of buffer solution. And we've got a tiny little beaker of hydrochloric acid, and we're going to add 10 centimeters cubed to a liter. So it's not much. It's a tiny amount. So what we're going to do with that strong acid, we're going to assume that all the H plus ions react with the ethanoate ions. So remember, H plus ions react with the ethanoate ions. That are, that's produced from the salt. Remember from the previous slide? Yeah. So we add the H plus. It's going to react with the negative ethanoate ion. So this forms ethanoic acid. So remember, it shifts to the left, that equilibrium. Go back if you're not too sure. But just have a look remember it shifts to the left so after adding the strong acid okay the amount of acid increases by the same amount of acid that we've actually added in okay so we had the um, so in other words the amount of acid ha has increased by 0 0.01 moles because that's how much acid we've added to 0 0.11 moles okay so we've produced more acid remember Adding the H plus reacts with the ethanoate ion that produces more acid. Yeah, but we're producing the same amount of acid as we did um, hydrochloric acid. And so therefore, the amount of ethanoate ions that's produced by the salt, the A minus, decreases by the same amount because it's that that's reacted with the H plus. And therefore, we have 0 0.09 moles of that. That's very, very important because now we've cracked the difficult bit. So we've got rid of, um, or we've taken into account the changes within these uh, within this system okay so now we now need to get the concentrations needed for the ka expression okay now this is the other little tricky bit okay so we've got the concentration of ha we now need to work that out because we've altered it we've added we've produced a little bit more so the concentration is 0 0.11 because that's how much many moles we've now got after adding the acid and we're going to divide that by our volume and our volume is 1.01. Now, the reason why is we had one decimeters cubed before. That's how much we had in our solution. Where is it? Uh, do, 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 do. Where's the decimeters cubed? Uh, I can't find it. Uh, Calculated peer change um, added to there. One decimeters cubed of a buffer. Okay, so we had one before, but then we've added another 10 centimeters cubed of acid. So we now have 1.01 decimeters cubed in total so we must take into account the extra bit of liquid we've added so then we work out our concentrations for each one of them so we need to do it for um, concentration of the salt as well because that's decreased remember and then once we've done that we then back onto normal okay it's only that little tricky bit there so we use the k expressions to rearrange and we get the concentration of h plus so there it is there okay concentration of h plus ka times the concentration of 
um, our um, ethanoic acid divided by the ethanoate ion, which is here. Put the figures in. So there we are. So concentration of H plus is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5 times by 0.11 divided by 0.09. These are the figures that we've used here. Okay. Uh, and then the concentration of H plus is that. And then what we need to do is obviously work out pH. So the pH, this is the pH after adding that hydrochloric acid. So the pH is just minus log of the concentration of H+, plus, which is 4.68. So remember, we need to work out the pH change, okay? Um, so the pH originally was 4.73. Now, after adding the acid, it's 4.68. So it's um, obviously incre it decreased a little bit. That's sensible because you've added an acid to it. So, But it hasn't changed much because that's what a buffer does. It resists the change. So the pH change... Um, is uh, 4.73 to 4.68 okay so that's the change in pH so quite tricky you've got to remember this bit here so what's increasing what's decreasing because we're adding an acid here so we need to work out the moles of that first work out the moles then work out the change and then revert it back into concentration to put it back into k expression okay okay so just come on to the last bit of the video, which is the use of buffers. Because you might think, all oh, right, so what? It's a buffer. Um, buffers are used everywhere. Okay, so they're used in household products um, and in the blood as well. And we need to know where these are used. So the first one is it's used in shampoo. And shampoos um, are actually marginally acidic. They're a little bit acidic, about uh, five to six. Um, and the hair becomes dry and damaged if it's exposed to alkaline conditions. Okay, so um, the buffer helps to resist changes in pH and keeps the hair soft and strong. Okay, so it's slightly acidic. So when you add water, remember water's um, um, slightly uh, neutral. It's a, it's, about, it's a neutral neutral substance, so that can dry out the hair. So using a shampoo, which is slightly, um, it's got a pH buffer and it keeps it at that pH and it means that your hair is nice and strong, although I don't have much of it. <laughs> um, so it's no good for me, actually. Um, okay, I do use shampoo, of course. Um, washing powder. Uh, biological washing powders they contain enzymes they can only work at specific pHs so we need to add a buffer into biological washing powders um, because that resists the change in pH when water is added to it um, and it allows the enzymes in the washing powder to work to their optimum pH and if it's working at the optimum pH it means that um, it means that the um, enzyme can get to work at breaking down the grease oils and dirt and everything on your clothes and the last one is blood so um it's really important to make sure that blood is maintained at a constant ph very similar to your washing powder um at 7.4 um and the reason why is because our cells and enzymes and all bodily functions rely on a very specific ph so enzymes will only work which helps to catalyze reactions in the body will only work at a certain ph so they're very fussy so obviously there's substances coming in and out of the blood all the time which can knock that ph off so the buffer helps to keep it the same um and basically Basically, it's carbon dioxide in your blood that helps to keep the um, the, the pH uh, constant within our bloodstream. Obviously, any deviation away from that, you get a condition called acidosis, um, where basically your blood becomes too acidic um, and your your body doesn't function as it should do. Okay. And so that's it. Um, quite a big topic, that one. There's a lot of stuff in there. That's on acids and bases. Um, like I say, there's a full range of videos for AQA for year one and year two. The full range of these ones. There's whiteboard tutorials and exam paper workthroughs as well. Um, all on Allery Chemistry. It's all for free. All I ask is you please subscribe. That would be fantastic. Um, you know, it just keeps the channel going. You know, the more supporters it has. Um, you know, the more sustainable it becomes. So, so make sure you do that. It would be brilliant. And also, if you'd like a copy of these slides, like I say, click on the link below in the description box. You can purchase them there. Absolutely fantastic value for money. All right. Okay, that's it. See you later. Bye-bye.